All right, welcome to the first tutorial. Um, I just filmed the welcome video and um, I felt like getting a little bit of coffee in. This is really supposed to be these tutorials where I'm sitting down with you, talking to you about a specific topic and trying to get as much value out of your time as possible. Not necessarily the fancy backgrounds, not necessarily any fancy music or any fancy cuts, transitions, whatever it is. It's just purely knowledge from me to you so you can benefit from it. Today we're talking about a topic that is absolutely paramount and crucial when it comes to anything from carving, spoons, cooks, bowls, paddles, anything, the construction of a wooden house, shelter, whatever it is. And it can also be quite crucial when it comes to tools, to tool handles, to the tools you bring, to wilderness traveling, canoeing, hiking, whatever it is. And that's, and that's talking about woods. What a huge topic. Um, I've done videos in the past about wood, a few years back in Japan, but today I want to specifically talk about different kinds of woods, what are we using, what I'm using them for, what my experience is with them, and if you have a question regarding um, the woods in your area, I hope this is actually answering it. All right, let's just jump right into it. I'm living in the temperate area of Austria at the edge of the Austrian Alps, but I've also lived in the boreal forest and the deciduous forests of northern and central Ontario. And I've also lived in the subtropical areas of Kyushu, Japan, which is the southernmost island except for Okinawa. What I've come to realize for my own work when it comes to greenwood, just a, a word on greenwood, why are we carving greenwood? And do you have to carve greenwood? No, you don't have to carve greenwood at all. It can be kiln dried wood, of course, as well. It's depending though on the species, which we're gonna get to, if it makes sense to try, try, if it makes sense to try carving dry wood or kiln dried wood, or if it doesn't make any sense, in my opinion. All of this, what we're talking today, is with respect to the fact that your knives are sharp, and we're gonna get to sharpening knives, what it needs, and where it should end up in an, in an upcoming tutorial video. Now, what I've realized over the years, being in all of these different areas of the world, is that you always can find some species of hardwood that you can carve spoons with. In general, I make a difference between um, diffused porous woods, diffused porous woods, or ring porous woods. All of this is happening in hardwoods, by the way. We're not talking about coniferous woods. I've carved juniper and I've carved cedar, and it is possible. But in my opinion, it's very difficult to get to a usable object that's gonna be usable for a long time without cracking. So if you have these woods in your area, juniper can be fun to carve. Please do not carve in yew. Yew is a poisonous plant and not only the berries, parts of the berries and the leaves, but also the wood is toxic to a certain degree, but it's toxic. Now, ring porous woods is, just as an example, for example, ash, hickory, walnut. It is in general woods that have the pores that transport the sap through the, the trunk um, from the roots up into the shoots. Um, that should be an album title at least. It is these these tubes. The phloem is is um concentrated in a ring, and it's quite open. So if you're looking at the end grain of ash or walnut, you can literally see little holes. This has two disadvantages. In my opinion, first of all, there's literally holes in it, and I have had a lot of situations with oak, for example, and walnut. First of all, these woods are in general very hard, very tough to carve. But I have literally had situations where I had 
um, soup and water leaking through those pores. So if you wanna have something that holds liquids, it shouldn't have holes. It is possible though, I have carved ash, there's a lot of people carving ash. If you're doing um, cooking spoons, um, spoons for porridge, etc., etc., you can absolutely carve these woods. The second disadvantage though that I wanted to get to is there is a little bit of a rough carving experience whenever you hit from the late wood into the, the spring wood and the early wood, which has of course all the thick pores in them because that's in spring the time when all the sap and the sugar goes up into the shoots and into the branches and um, into um, the leaves and fruit, etc. etc. So it's not the nicest carving experience. When it comes to oak, hickory, um, ash, walnut, I have to say though these are great woods in general for tool handles in my opinion, especially hickory, ash, um, oak in some situations. In Japan for example all tool handles are made from um, um, kashi, kashi or donguri, which is oak. In comparison to that, in Europe and North America, we mostly use, use hickory and ash. Hickory being North America, ash being absolutely traditional in Europe for thousands of years, together with elm and a couple of other woods, but ash especially. If you want to make tool handles, axe handles especially, you can carve them green if you want to, especially because of the straight grain. Ash is great for that because once it dries, it's not going to twist and bend that much. So ash is great for that. And you can carve it green, you can let it sit and rest and leave a little bit longer on both sides for the checking that occurs very often during the drying process. And then you can just finish it dry. Now, diffused porous woods are very dense. Dense in a matter of you do not really see any pores in the end grain. If you're thinking about beech, cherry, um, birch, most fruit woods like apple, pear, damson, prune, um, hornbeam, etc., etc., birch, in my opinion, and maple being two species is really to put up on top for a great carving experience. The end grain is not going to show you any pores. It's going to be just a very homogeneous type of surface. I always compare it to fine marzipan, but that's just maybe not working for everybody. But there is a certain kind of carving experience where I just feel like I'm my knife's gliding through marzipan. These woods are, in my opinion, great to carve. Now, cherry, birch, um, types of maple etc you're finding throughout the temperate area of the world doesn't really matter where you are there's always pockets sometimes you find a little bit more beach sometimes you find a little bit more poplar which is possible but in my opinion a little bit weak for utensils but can be used poplar in Japan I was mostly mostly using using sakura kaide which is maple um, other woods that I can't, can't get here like magnolia for example or momo which is um, peach and they had very much the same um, characteristics. Now there's some arid areas in the world. For example, um, I get a lot of messages from people out of Utah, Texas, um, California, that have a problem finding these kind of woods. There I know a lot of people who use mesquite and other local hardwoods that are not typically maybe falling into the category of birch and maple, etc. But they're absolutely usable. So another tip I want to give you at this point here, not everybody is living countryside with a bunch of forests around where you can just walk up to a farmer and ask if, you know, after, excuse me, after the last um, taking down a hedge or like taking down part of a forest or like doing um, firewood, etc. If you can get this and that amount of offcuts, usually people say yes, especially and you come back with a nicely carved spoon. So that's a little tip on the side. Not everybody has this kind of luxury though. My biggest advice in this moment to get green woods that you can use, especially the ones that I mentioned before, of course, is contacting tree surgeons, arborists, and other people or um, job jobs in your area who are um, to cut down woods in, in, in towns, for example, around parking lots, around 
parks, etc., very often trees have to be pruned in a pretty big fashion and there's a lot of wood coming from it and very often this wood is going to waste or it's just going to be um, chopped up into um, fine cho um, wood shavings or um, wood chips for, um, for heating, That's for like biodegradable um, heat source for example. And in the past this has been a great source for me to have a steady supply of wood. So that's one of the tips. Now, when we store any wood that we get, we're trying to get it as long as possible. But keep in mind already what you want to do. You want to make eating spoons, for example, or do you want to make cooking spoons or bowls, whatever. It's kind of depending on the diameter that you're getting. And diameter wise, we're going to talk about the wood when I'm, I'm showing you specific pieces that I do. I'm going to show you what, um, what diameter it came from, what I recommend, etc. But there's different diameters, period. Keep it as long as possible. And even if it's an eating spoon, keep it 25 centimeters long or 10 inches or whatever, depending on the, on the piece of wood that you get. Because there's going to be checking in the end. Now, you can seal the ends with oil, with wax, or with specific products that you can get for sealing end grain. That's one option. But usually, even bigger logs are not really checking that much further in than like 2 inches, 3 inches, maybe 5 to 7 centimeters max. Except for some fruit woods that just, or like lilac, lilac, beautiful wood, but... I had situations where I was in the middle of carving it, it was already small diameter, should have been just fine and I just heard a snap and there was a crack right through the middle of the spoon. So there is woods that are tending to crack quite um, explosively or like quite um, sensationally in a way. Anyways. Seal the end grains and just like calculate that there is going to be wood having to come off the ends. When you're carving wood, like I said before, green has the advantage of being easy on your body, easy on your knives, and it just behaves, behaves a little bit differently. Green doesn't really give you a nice finish though, and a lot of woods have the tendency to change in shape, shrink, either laterally or tangentially when from the point that you carve them green to like an 80% blank um, until you have them cured and then finish them off. That has to be taken into consideration and over the years you're going to find out that there's going to be certain woods like cherry for example that you really need to be a little bit make a little bit flatter and wider in the blank because they have, it has the tendency to really shrink um, laterally and it's just gonna become deeper and smaller, just as an example. So there's a lot of personal experience, but in general, this is rather a quick process once you've carved a certain kind of wood more often than once or twice, you're gonna see, okay, I have to go a little bit wider on purpose because it tends to do this and that. The advantage on the other side of dry wood is that it finishes beautifully. So if you have a sharp knife without any nicks, with a very keen edge, you're able to get a nearly burnished finish on the outside with a fine luster. So especially these um, hardwoods we're talking about, of course, they're just leaving, the tougher they are, the denser they are in general, just the finer of a finish they're leaving on the outside, but the, sh the, the, the better and sharper a knife they need. So there's a reason why there's different grades of knife steels and some more expensive knives really come with a better steel, because especially through these tougher, harder woods, when they dry, you need a finer steel to keep these knives um, sharp without any nicks, without any micro damage, etc, etc. But we're already getting ahead of ourselves. Carving dry wood. Sorry, I just needed to get back to my train of thought here. Carving dry wood to start with is absolutely possible. There's a lot of people I've talked to who live in cities all over the world who do not have any access to green wood and they literally buy 
kiln dried wood at the wood supply. It is absolutely possible. It's going to be a little bit harder on your tools and I would choose more wisely the wood that I'm choosing for that or like that I'm picking up for that because there's a lot of woods that are so tough when they're dry that it's fine for me to do finishing cuts but it's not a lot of fun and if I had to work my way from a, a billet or a blank with the axing and all the stock removal etc into that type of wood I would not very much enjoy the experience. I give you a very short list of woods that I would consider carving absolutely dry from a board that is thick enough to get a crank into it and all of the other stuff we're going to be talking about. Birch, absolutely birch. Some types of maple, not necessarily sugar maple. European maple, here we have silver maple, etc. Yes. Um, soft maple, yes. Certain types of cherry, again. There's so many different types of cherry and I've come across, for example, black cherry, I would absolutely consider carving bone dry. Sakura and other types of um, fruit bearing cherry becomes extremely tough, just like damson, pear, apple, all of these woods are so hard that I would never consider working them completely dry. It's just not enjoyable. Walnut, yes ish butternut definitely black walnut yes european walnut i'm not sure what types we really have how they are different i would consider black walnut for doing that not european walnut way too tough absolutely um way too tough um that's a short list there's a couple more but this is more or less what i would look for at a lumber yard for example if this is really what you have to do I think for today, the last thing I want to tell you is the more you are preventing or the, the, let's just say like that, the more you work in the wood down into small diameter throughout and very evenly and symmetric when it comes to your 80% blank from green curing to dry and then finishing, the less warpage you have, the more of a straight piece of wood without knots you're finding the less warpage and twisting you have um, and the less shrinkage in the bowl you're gonna have. Of course it also majorly reduces the, the risk and the possibility of cracking if you're trying to keep things at a smaller diameter. Always think about it that way. A bigger body of wood is gonna hold more moisture than a small one. So as the wood is drying and you kept it too thick in some areas and thinner in other areas, the wood can't really move here like on the thicker parts while it loses the moisture and it's just gonna get have too much stress inside it and it's just gonna have to crack since the growth rings are shrinking within themselves become smaller this way at, on the whole length. So if there is a bigger body of wood um, it's not going to be able to, to, to take this kind of stress from this extreme shrinkage and it just has to open up somewhere in order to make the shrinkage possible. Long story, very long, just try to work the wood down to an even and small diameter, small thickness throughout the bowl, etc, etc, and you're not going to have any problem with cracking. Well. This about concludes the first very long episode, 20 minutes, holy cow. Okay, in the future, I think we're gonna hold these a little bit shorter, but I want to give you a very good amount of knowledge for our first tutorial on the channel. I hope this was fun for you. I'm, as I said, these are not gonna be the most fancy, entertaining music underlying and um, voiceover videos because I wanna keep them crisp for me and I want to keep them just piled up with knowledge for you. So please let me know under this video here what are you thinking, requests, suggestions, etc. Because I'm working here for you on this page. And get the word out that I'm doing this. Get the word out that there is quality instruction available for a very small amount of money. And despite not 
being very fond of talking about funds. It's just part of the deal and it's allowing me to get these to you. Cheers.